aromatic compounds, such as benzene shown here, are very important in the organic chemistry lab. They also play important roles in many biological systems, such as DNA. DNA is composed of a series of aromatic compounds, um, but they, of course, have a slightly different structure than our benzene shown here. Now, previously, when we've talked about aromatic compounds, we've mostly talked about alternating double bonds and how we have to have a conjugated system, right? So with our, our benzene here, we would have our six carbons, each sp2 hybridized with those p orbitals sticking up and above and below each of our carbons. And these p orbitals are then connected in this pi bonding system around our ring. So if this is all that we need to have an aromatic compound, you might expect that we could have a wide variety of different kinds of aromatic compounds just by changing the size of our ring and um, again alternating those double bonds throughout our structure. So let's say we have a cyclooctatetrene. So we have our eight membered ring and we put four double bonds around our ring system. Right? So this would make our structure here, our cyclooctatetrene. It would look like a conjugated system, right, where we have our p orbitals on each of these carbons and our alternating double bonds. So, according to the structure shown here, it looks like it should be aromatic. However, if we actually synthesize cyclooctatetrene, what we would find is that it actually is not aromatic and in fact is surprisingly unstable. So despite having the same alternating double bonds and pi bonding system that we see with benzene, it actually is anti-aromatic. So it doesn't have the normal resonance stabilization that we see with benzene. So what makes something like cyclooctatetrene different from benzene? We again have same alternating double bonds. We have the same p orbitals. Why is it different? To understand this, we have to go back to something that we learned about in general chemistry, which is molecular orbital theory. With our traditional valence bonding theory, we're used to thinking of bonds between atoms forming just based on overlap of orbitals, right? So in our benzene, we have our sp2 hybridized carbons, they form a sigma bond with their two um, head-on overlapping sp2 orbitals. And then they use their p orbitals to form a side-on overlapping pi bond. Right? So these are the typical bonds that we talk about when we think of valence bonding. Now in molecular orbital theory, we instead are taking our orbitals from our individual atoms, and we're going to combine them together to make entirely new molecular orbitals. So in the case of our hydrogen molecule, H2, each of our hydrogen atoms has a single 1s orbital. Um, our typical valence bonding perspective would just be those two hydrogens overlapping together with their 1s orbitals. So we get something like this which would again result in a head-on overlapping sigma bond. So this is our valence bonding model. And molecular bonding, each of these are going to mix their two orbitals together, essentially to create two new orbitals. When we combine these two orbitals together, they can either combine in an additive manner, so this would make a bonding orbital, so we'll mark this as our sigma bonding orbital, or they can add together in a uh, destructive or subtractive method. This creates a high energy antibonding orbital. All of our antibonding orbitals are marked with little stars to represent the fact that they are antibonding orbitals. Of course, both of these orbitals will then differ in terms of their overall energy, 
Anti-bonding orbitals are very high energy orbitals. Um, they tend to destabilize molecules. And our bonding orbitals down here are stable, low energy orbitals that will help to hold our molecules together. In the case of hydrogen, our hydrogen molecule, if we take the two electrons from our individual hydrogens, both of those electrons can sit in this, non, this bonding orbital since we can have two electrons per orbital. And so that leads to a strengthening of our hydrogens together um, as we form that, that bond. If we add electrons into antibonding orbitals, this is going to destabilize our molecule and make it um, less likely to form. Now that we understand the basic molecular orbital model for hydrogen, let's try to apply it to our benzene. So in our benzene here, we're just going to look at our p orbitals combining together to make our molecular pi bonding orbitals. So we're not considering our, our sigma bonds at this time, although of course those are also forming and holding together our carbons here in this molecule. So again, each of our carbons here has a p bonding orbital. So we have our six p orbitals, and these are all going to be combined in order to make our molecular orbitals for our benzene molecule. Now our key role of molecular orbital theory is that the number of atomic orbitals is always going to be equal to the number of molecular orbitals. So if we have six p orbitals initially from our carbons, when we combine those together to make our molecular pi bonding orbitals, we're going to have six different molecular orbitals overall. So we'll have one orbital where all of our uh, p orbitals are bonding together in a positive manner, so a complete positive addition. We also will have two other orbitals where most of our p orbitals are bonding together in a positive manner, but we have some that are uh, bonding in a uh, negative manner. And then we'll have three higher energy anti-bonding orbitals. Right, so we'll have a majority bonding in that negative manner or all of our atoms bonding in a negative manner. So again, we'll have six different orbitals from our six different p orbitals. These are all those orbitals clashing against one another. These are all of our orbitals that form from our orbitals working together and bonding in these bonding orbitals. So this is what our orbitals will look like. Now, if we're going to put our electrons in here to see what our, our bonding looks like for benzene, we need to identify how many electrons we'll have in this pi bonding system. So we just need to count up our overall uh, pi electrons or the electrons that would be in our, our p orbitals. So of course we would have two, two and two from each of our double bonds. So that's six total electrons. Now if we go over to our orbital diagram. So we start with our lowest energy orbital. Two electrons go here, two electrons here, and two electrons here. All of our electrons right now are in these lower energy bonding orbitals. And so this contributes to our strong aromatic benzene structure. If we have any of our uh, electrons in our antibonding orbitals, um, then these will make our structure anti-aromatic. They'll oppose the formation of that strong aromatic structure and make our molecule weaker overall. So now let's examine the case of our cyclooctatetrene. Let's see if we can explain why our cyclooctatetrene is anti-aromatic based on our molecular orbital theory. So again, we're going to have eight p orbitals that are each going to contribute to eight molecular orbitals. We'll have half of these molecular orbitals forming in an additive manner, and we'll have half of them forming in a uh, subtractive or, or negative manner. 
Now, in order to draw out my orbitals here, I'm going to use a little trick called a frost circle. So this is going to help me to uh, know where to put my orbitals. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my ring structure and I'm going to draw it with one of my points pointing downwards. So we have our point here and we have two bonds coming out and then we have two bonds going up and then we have our final bonds going up there. So here's our eight-membered eight ring. I'm then going to draw a circle around my structure here where that circle should meet at each of the points of my ring structure. So let me uh, slightly adjust my sides here. And now at each point, where the circle meets my ring, I want to draw one of my orbitals. So I'd have an orbital down here at that bottom point, an orbital here, 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 and so on. The center line of my ring system is going to be basically a, a net zero change in energy relative to my individual atoms. So any orbitals that are right here along the center line, at the center of my uh, ring structure, these we would call non-bonding orbitals. So they're not as bad as anti-bonding orbitals. Anti-bonding orbitals actually um, destabilize your structure. Non-bonding orbitals don't help to stabilize your structure, but they aren't as negative as our anti-bonding orbitals. So again, we have anti-bonding at the top, Non-bonding will be right along that center line, and our bonding orbitals are all down here at the bottom. Now again, with my four double bonds in my ring structure, this is two, 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 and two electrons for eight total. Now let's go ahead and assign them to my orbitals, starting with the lowest energy. Two electrons, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. I assign my last two electrons to those two individual non-bonding orbitals. So in my cyclooctatetrene, I have two electrons that have to occupy non-bonding orbitals. What this means is that I don't have the same extra stabilization that I have in benzene where I was able to stack all of those electrons into my bonding orbitals. And so my cyclooctatetrene structure is actually much less stable than I would expect for an aromatic structure and becomes an anti-aromatic structure. Now it turns out there's a shortcut to determining if a structure is aromatic or anti-aromatic. This shortcut is called Huckel's rule. So this is named after the German scientist Eric Huckel, um, who uh, developed some of this uh, molecular orbital aromatic theory. Uh, so Huckel's rule says that if we have any number n, a whole number, times 4 plus 2, then we will have an aromatic compound. This is looking specifically at our uh, pi electrons, right? those electrons that we are assigning in this uh, molecular orbital diagram. So if pi electrons are equal to 4n plus 2, where n can be 0, 1, 2, 3, etc., um, or, well, n can be 1, 2, 3, 4, etc., then we have an aromatic compound. So if, for example, n is equal to 1. We get 4 times 1 plus 2, or 6. So that would be the case for uh, benzene. Benzene has 6 electrons and is aromatic. If we look at our cyclooctatetrene here, so if we put 4 
with n equal to 2, 4 times 2 plus 2, oh, 4 times 2 is 8, plus 2 is 10, right? So we can have 6 electrons, or we can have 10 electrons, but we can't have 8 electrons. Our cyclooctatetrine does not fit in our little Huckel's rule here, and so it is anti-aromatic. Now let's consider a few unique scenarios with slightly different looking structures. So in our ring structure here, we don't have the typical alternating double bonds that we have in benzene or the cyclooctatetrine that we've looked at before. However, if we look at our structure, so we have our p orbitals on each of these carbons in our ring structure. So this p orbital will be holding our lone pair while our other p orbitals participate in our uh, double bonds on the left and right side. And so we can actually see that this looks like a conjugated system. So it's important to ask ourselves here, could we have an aromatic system here even without that normal alternating double bond structure? So let's go ahead and draw our ring in here again. So here we have our ring structure, again with my point going downwards. There's my frost circle. Here are my bonding points, my orbitals. Um, and the center point for my structure will be actually slightly above these orbitals here. So the midpoint of my um, pentagon is actually going to be uh, slightly above my two points down here. Now, if I count up my electrons, so I have, of course, two in each of these double bonds. But now, these two electrons from my lone pair would also be placed inside my p orbital. And so I want to count those electrons, too. So that gives me six total electrons. Now, if we apply Huckel's rule here, we know that we 4 with n equals to 1 plus 2 equals 6. So Huckel's rule would predict that this is aromatic. Let's confirm that with our frost circle. So if we take our six electrons, two would go in here in a bonding orbital. These orbitals are actually still bonding orbitals as well because they're going to be slightly below that uh, center line. So we put our remaining four electrons in these bonding orbitals and all of our electrons are in bonding orbitals. So as long as we have an sp2 hybridized carbon in our ring system, we still have the potential for an aromatic structure to form. We just need all of our carbons to be sp2 hybridized and then we can count whether we're going to be aromatic or non-aromatic, anti-aromatic, based on how many electrons we have in our, our structure. Right? So you could potentially have a carbocation um, that could be aromatic if you have the right number of electrons. Um, of course, in this case here, uh, we would end up with uh, only four electrons instead of the six that we need to be aromatic. Another important scenario to consider is heterocyclic systems. So here we have a ring structure that looks just like benzene, except we have nitrogen here at the bottom of our ring. Now, we again have sp2 hybridized atoms around our ring. We have two electrons from each of these double bonds. But what about our nitrogen itself? Now remember, nitrogen does have a lone pair. However, if we draw this out, so this is going to be sp2 hybridized, we would have two of our sp2 orbitals going to each of these carbons. We have our p orbital, and we know that that p orbital has to have our electron that is bonding with our adjacent p orbital on the carbon next door. So that means that our lone pair is actually sitting in the last sp2 orbital that's sticking out away from our ring structure. So even though we have a lone pair on this nitrogen, that lone pair 
is actually not going to participate in our pi bonding since it's in this sp2 orbital sticking outside of the ring. At this point then we just have six electrons in our ring system which again allows us to fulfill Huckel's rule. So we would have our, our six orbitals and all six of our electrons would be in the low bonding orbitals with none of those electrons assigned to our anti-bonding orbitals. With any kind of heteroaromatic system like this, you always have to consider where the extra electrons on that heteroatom might be. Uh, for nitrogen, they could be either in the sp2 orbital pointing outside of the ring, or they could be in that p orbital, depending on um, whether we have anything else bonded to that sp2 orbital pointing out of the ring. For oxygen, you're always going to have one pair of electrons in the ring participating in your pi bonding, and one electron outside. Um, so oxygen is a relatively easy case, you just have to add those two electrons into your overall pi bonding system. Nitrogen, you have to be a little bit careful about and look to see where those pi electrons um, from the lone pair should be. So this will allow our heterocyclic systems to also be aromatic. So this is an aromatic system and it is also heterocyclic. Um, so we can refer to it as heteroaromatic. Heteroaromatic compounds are extremely important. Um, so all of our, our DNA bases are actually heteroaromatic systems. Um, and again, that aromaticity um, lends some very unique properties to our bases, including that very important pi stacking interaction that can occur to strengthen our DNA double helix. So again, these aromatic structures, they're very important in organic chemistry, but they're also very important for the very biology that holds our cells together, our, our DNA together, and allows our cells to behave as we expect them to.